Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, you make us both to will and to do those things that are good and acceptable in your sight. Let your heavenly hand ever guide us and your Holy Spirit ever be with us to direct us in knowledge and obedience of your word that we may obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're in Galatians. Uh, last week we got started. Uh, we didn't get too far uh, as we were sort of trying to articulate a little bit more of the problem. And so that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, we're in the problem. I'm following the, uh, the outline from the Lutheran Study Bible. So we got to the greetings and then we got to the problem. Is there another gospel? And no. Uh, and today we're going to be picking up um, the gospel preached by Paul is the only gospel. And scripture does uh, reaffirm that. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to move more into the problem. As you can probably tell, he's going to spend a lot of time sort of building up to the problem. Uh, and sometimes we just want to jump ahead instead of following the arguments he's going to use to build up to the problem. Uh, but don't worry, I'll name the problem and then we'll go through and see how he builds up to it. Uh, but uh, let's get, we're going to start with uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. So his accusers, St. Paul's accusers, was basically they were trying to say anything that would discredit St. Paul, including basically saying that uh, this gospel was you know, invented by St. Paul or invented by the apostles or anything. Okay? Um, but now what was interesting about that argument is where does, how did St. Paul come into being in proclaiming that gospel? You may remember when Saul, that was his name, uh, before the uh, Damascus Road experience where he met Christ, okay? Um, but I'm going to pick that up in Acts chapter 9, verse 6. Now here, God is speaking to Ananias. He says, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. So God is giving instruction to Ananias. Verse 17, let's pick up the text there. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, referring to Paul or Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. So bottom line is this is a, a beautiful proof text that basically says, who is the one that was directing Paul? The answer, this is coming from God. It's not coming from anyone else. It's not like somebody else sent Paul. God himself called Paul. Okay. And uh, you even have uh, Ananias uh, uh, reaffirming that, okay, that this call comes from God. So as we take a look at this gospel, um, we realize there's a difference between man's gospel and God's gospel. Um, Christ, uh, or I should say, Going back to what happened with Ananias, uh, God, or you could say Christ, does not tell Ananias, or doesn't tell uh, Paul to enter the city to learn the gospel from Ananias. Did Paul learn anything from Ananias? The answer is no. What did what was Ananias's role for Saint Paul there, or or Saul? Is huh? Messenger. Just the messenger. God told me, hit me to come, and I'm here, and I'm going to put my hands on you, uh, and you're going to see and be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was no teaching, okay? And that's important. And you might be thinking, well, where did St. Paul get all this knowledge from? Mm -hmm. eh, we'll pick that up a, a little bit later. So just hang on to that thought, okay? Okay. 
because uh, we will uh, come back to it. But uh, let's continue on with uh, verse 12. Uh, Paul writes, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. So God revealed himself to St. Paul. And St. Paul has similar words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. You got to remember, St. Paul was not there during the Lord's Supper. Okay. But some of our greatest teachings on the Lord's Supper comes from St. Paul. So how did he know? God revealed it to him. Okay. So he very clearly says, I'm receiving this from the Lord. Okay. This isn't from anybody else, but from God. So the, the, you could say the, um, the authority here is Paul is acting in God's authority. It's God's gospel. God is sending him. This is all about what God has told him to do. Okay, so let's go on to now we're going to get into more of the problem because there was a problem going on. We heard last week about how they were willing to give up the gospel because of what some people had said to them. And so now we're going to move into sort of the background to the problem. Slowly, I should probably let, like to add to that uh, little title there, slowly moving toward a solution because it's about almost like a full chapter. Okay, and you're going to be sitting there going, come on, St. Paul, why can't you tell me what the problem is? And for those of you who always like to know things quickly instead of slowly, let me tell you what the problem is. Whenever you interfere with the forgiveness of sins, you are interfering with the gospel. That's the problem, plain and simple. The gospel, the forgiveness of sins, is given to you freely by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You've heard this. This should be nothing new. But yet our sinful nature sometimes creep, creeps in, and we like to interfere with it. Let me give you an example, at least one that I was taught from seminary, on how we could possibly interfere with this. So what do we do on Sunday morning? Oh, we have our opening hymn, we have the invocation, and then we move into the confession of sins. What happens immediately after the confession of sins? Absolution. Absolution, you're given forgiveness. Okay, there's nothing that separates that. What would happen if churches there started saying, uh, confess your sins, confess your sins. Okay, we're confessing our sins, but then they're like, we need to have an offering. Hmm. Well, what about the forgiveness? Well, we're going to hold off on the forgiveness for a while. Let's just wait until the offering plates get filled first and then give you the forgiveness. Notice what's being held hostage. The forgiveness of sins is being held hostage. Now, I'm kind of making this up. I really don't know of any churches that do that. But I'm just using this as an example. Whenever the forgiveness of sins is being held hostage... You're not forgiven yet. Yes. Catholics. Ooh. Catholics say you have to say penance first. Ooh, thank you. Some traditions say you have to say penance first before you uh, receive that forgiveness. Or even better yet, uh, sometimes I even hear this in the Lutheran guilt type category, you know, was my confession sincere enough? Whoa, ho, oh, no, 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 stop, stop. Did Jesus die on the cross? Are not your sins forgiven? Yes. And, not the whole, and are also not the whole world's sins forgiven? The answer is yes. Whenever you enter into anything that separates you from the forgiveness of sins, whenever you insert anything, you're holding that forgiveness of sins hostage and you're distorting the gospel. So we're gonna find out slowly what was hindering the people 
uh, that got that Paul wrote had to write this letter to the Galatians. Yes. It always reminds me of the word the difference between penance and penitent sinner. Our, our feeling towards that is that am I a penitent sinner unless I say something? Okay, so what is the purpose of us confessing sins? Because that's, I think, what, where you're kind of getting at is, you know, when, uh, what, why do we confess when we are forgiven? Okay, because all I just have to look to, I'm sorry, my screen is covering the, my uh, altar here a little bit, but I just have to look to the cross of Jesus and I am reminded of the forgiveness of sins. So why do I need to confess? Because I think sometimes we, when we sin, we're not thinking about what we're doing. What always gets me in the confession about things I fail to do, mm -hmm. that's, it's home. Okay, so it, when we confess our sins, it reminds us of all the things that we fail to do. Okay, uh, so not only sins of commission, uh, but sins of omission, as we like to say. Commission is sins that you've done, omission of things that you failed to do. Okay, uh, fair enough. Okay, but God already knows, mm -hmm. and are you not already forgiven? Yes, you're already forgiven. So why do we need to confess? It's almost like, why do we need to pray? God knows what we need. He knows our heart. He knows more than better what we need than I know what I need. But it's a relationship that he's looking for. Ah, thank you, thank you. God is, first of all, says pray. Scriptures speak about confessing. And Don, as you said, you know, it's about the relationship. Do you believe in God? And he says, pray to me. So we pray. Okay. Yes, God knows what's in our heart. But he, it's, as we pray, we're putting our faith and trust that God is going to hear our prayers. As we confess, we're putting our faith and trust that God is also going to hear that confession and bring us forgiveness. Okay, It's not that you have to confess in order to be forgiven. And if you fail to forgot, confess, then you're not forgiven. Well, what happens if I forget some things? Because as I get older, I sometimes forget things. Does that mean I'm no longer forgiven? No, the forgiveness comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's get into this a little bit. Um, and let's uh, move uh, back to uh, Galatians chapter uh, 1, verse 13. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Okay. Um, so Paul here is even fessing up saying, you know, I once tried to destroy this gospel, okay, but Paul, or Saul, couldn't, okay? He tried to persecute it, okay? But then there was that conversion. And then to uh, put a, a little bit of a, a connection here, let's just bring up what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, when Paul says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Okay. So notice what happened with St. Paul. Was St. Paul really the enemy? No. The devil really is the enemy. God was able to take somebody who was listening to the devil and change his heart. And now he is teaching Christ. Beautiful teaching point for us in our relationship with other people. People are not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. Okay, because the devil is trying to go out there and destroy the church and the gospel. Uh, Saul was listening to that, and God changed his heart. But let's continue on. Verse 14. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions 
of my father's. So notice he was excelling, okay, and extremely zealous and focusing on traditions. Traditions instead of God's word. Notice the emphasis uh, was I was. That's key. Whenever we start putting the emphasis on what I am doing, then that's what we call the works of the law. The greatest example of this is take a look at the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments give you instruction. And there's nothing wrong with that law of God that gives us that instruction. Because when we hear that law of God, we are reminded of how we have failed to keep that law and how we have broken that law. And so the law has a purpose. It shows us we need a Savior. And in comes the Gospel, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is that Savior, who brings us the forgiveness of sins. Yes? And that's Paul speaking up there. You can see that he was well educated and he was extremely in the tradition of, of his faith. And maybe that's one of the reasons why he was picked. Three more slides. Oh. Hang on to that thought. You're gonna, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Three more slides. Remember, I said we're moving slowly. I, I'm going to get to that thought. I, it, I, I just quickly looked on my notes, and I'm like, I got three more slides for now. We're, we're going to get there. So just hang on to that thought. So for Galatians 1.14, I want to compare the Saul, pre-converted Saul, notice the I was, I was, I'm doing all these things. And now compare and contrast that with what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Notice the difference between I was doing this, I was doing that, I was doing this versus... Hey, we're part of the body of Christ. Notice an I versus now we. And this is also very important for us in the Christian faith. It's because we have to realize the gospel is all about Christ. It's not about me. Okay? And then how the church is part of the body of Christ. Okay? So that's a plural, not a singular. But too often people start thinking it's, you know, it's just me and Jesus, me and Jesus. Well, there's a few other believers out there besides just you. And we are all connected to Christ and we're connected to one another. So when Paul or when anyone starts using a lot of I language, I always start cringing at that point. Because you could say someone was trying to justify themselves, which then pushes Christ out of the picture. So again, just sort of getting you a little bit more information into what the problem is. But let's continue on. Verse 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, notice there's a comma here, so I'm not going to finish this sentence, um, St. Paul has very long sentences, okay? So we're talking about God, okay? God who had called him before he was born, okay? And then I pair this with uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. So very similar to what happened with Jeremiah, Paul is bringing up that same concept. Now, I'm going to test your memory here. Do you remember a couple weeks ago in a sermon? Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Pastor, you mean we're supposed to remember those sermons? I, I asked this as a question, and it was a, a question where the answer was, I do not know. Remember, I said I'm going to give you the answer first, and the answer is, I do not know. And what was the question? Uh, was the, when was the soul created? At the 
time of creation or at the time of conception, okay? Well, these verses actually kind of beg that question again, okay? And remember, the correct answer is we don't know. But just to let you know, when you come across this, and it was a fairly recent sermon, I was kind of talking about it, I figured, let's just sort of bring this up again, okay? Uh, because here it, it very clearly says, you know, that God called me before I was born, okay? God I was, uh, was appointed, okay? Set apart, and you could say predestined. So when we get to predestination, we have to be a little careful. And what do we mean by predestination? Uh, that God does extend his grace and mercy to us, and we have the gift of eternal life, okay? When was that gift of eternal life given? Huh? Before he was born, yeah. Well, hold on a second. I, was, I, let, I want to finish up my, my... I don't want to get into the souls yet. Okay. I want to first get, finish up the, the, this idea here of when were we given that gift of heaven? Baptism. I'm sorry, what? Baptism. Baptism, we receive that gift. You're right. Okay. That's how we're brought into that uh, kingdom. Okay. So when did God first extend that grace and mercy? When Jesus dies on the cross, our sins are forgiven. How do we receive that gift? Through holy baptism, okay? When does God stop extending that gift? Never. Never? When, when you die? die? How about let's just go with the last day, okay? <laughs> when, when you finally get to that judgment day, Okay, if you have been rejecting that gift, I don't even know if he really does, does he actually ever stop extending it or does he just sort of confirm your rejection of it? Mm -hmm. But either way, at that point, if you're not believing and trusting in the gospel, you are doomed, okay? Uh, but what I wanna focus on is that God is constantly extending that gift to you while you are still breathing, okay? while you're still here on earth. And so this is what we mean by predestination, is that God wants you to be with him in heaven above and he has prepared a place for you in heaven above. The forgiveness of sins is already yours. Stop rejecting it. Notice what happens with this gift of forgiveness. It is still there, okay? It's not conditional. It's given to you freely from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. His death on the cross accomplishes that gift. How do we receive that gift? Through holy baptism, through faith and trust in the promises of God, we receive that gift and we have eternal life. Okay, John, you had a question about some souls? You're right, and that, that soul is already predestined, and whether you want to say at the, at the time of conception when the soul and the body are being knit together, um, and that predestination is to heaven. Remember, Christ, the forgiveness of sins. Where Christians get into trouble with that predestination, or some Christians get into trouble, not us, um, they, they think that, well, God has set apart some souls for heaven and some souls for hell. We call that a double predestination. And the answer to that is scripture never says that God sets apart some souls for hell. Scripture does talk about how God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. And when we look at the cross of Jesus, we see forgiveness of sins for the entire world. We don't see God setting apart a certain group of people and saying, you're gonna go to hell because God said so. Okay, 
And if you follow what John chapter 3, verse 17 says, uh, that we basically condemn ourselves. We are the ones that have rejected God's grace. So keep this in mind when we start looking at things like this with, before I was born, God called us by grace. Yeah, not a problem. He wants me to be with him in heaven above. We don't have a problem with this. We rejoice in this. This is the gospel. So let's go on with a verse, or did, was, did I see another question? Yeah. yeah. It confuses me a little bit because if he, I mean, I believe he knew you in the womb, he knew you before right. you were born, he knows all this. So then why would he reject you after you're born and before you're baptized? Because we talked about that separation. God is not rejecting you. Okay. God is the one that's doing the calling. So okay. It goes back to if you die between birth and baptism. Who's doing the rejection? Not, you don't choose to die. Uh, the let me let me answer the question is uh, that we are actually rejecting. The, the child who's born is rejecting God when he dies. Well, because of our sinful nature. Okay, that, that sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve, okay, uh, that, that we are rejecting. The child doesn't have a choice of dying or living, the baby. Okay, so when a child is born, mm -hmm. okay, is there, let me ask the, uh, answer the question by asking a question. Is there a spiritual neutral? Okay, good. We're on the same page here. So you are either in Christ or you're not in Christ. What I'm teaching here from this, this Bible passage is that God wants you in Christ. Your sins are forgiven because of Jesus' death on the cross. Okay. But yet we have a sinful nature that is rebellious against God and rejecting God. Okay. And so when a child is born, we're going to say a child is in that mode of rejection until Christ claims us as his own. We do find out that um, there are certain instances based on uh, God's word where like John the Baptist in utero, in utero okay, uh, has faith, okay, but again, those are based on God's word. And so that's how God uh, gives us that faith. Could that child in utero also receive the, that faith through God's word? The answer is yes, okay. Um, but by nature, our nature is rejecting Christ. So Christ is extending his arm, so to speak, and saying, here's the forgiveness of sins. Our sinful nature is kind of like closed arms. So if I was not exposed to God's word and I'm born, I'm naturally going to be rejecting that word of God. And then God has to do a conversion on me. Remember Saul. He was rejecting that word of God very clearly. And we're going to find out in a couple of slides that he was well educated in God's word. But he was an adult. Um, but where does all that come from? So would you be better off dying in utero than after birth? You so know, the child the, in utero was rejected also? Okay, now here's, um, when you're talking about children in utero, okay, before they are born, okay, we do not have a clear command of God. So we are supposed to be teaching these children, okay, bringing them to the services of God's house, educating them, proclaiming the gospel to them. Um, it's kind of, we can't baptize them before they're born. It's a little challenging, okay? It's not good for the child. Um, and so we're going to entrust them into God's uh, care. So we don't know before a child is born, but once a child is born, we know what to do with them, is to continue to have God's word applied to them. Yes. But we don't. We baptize them in church. Um, Six or seven or 
there, there was an old tradition of trying to get that child almost like immediately baptized. Uh, unfortunately, you're right in today's society, we sometimes wait so months. Our fault. We're for not doing this. You're right. We, I would uh, always encourage parents to have the child um, baptized. Uh, there was actually even some fear of, uh, you know, if the child's life was even in jeopardy, then bring the pastor on over to have the child baptized. And actually, if you were kind of born in a, a Catholic uh, hospital, it was somewhat common knowledge that a lot of the nuns would just come by and quick baptize the child right away. And so that uh, they would kind of say, okay, at least God's claiming this one, even before the parents would have a, child, a chance to have the child baptized, just in case. To which I sort of smile and the church sort of smile and said, yeah, it's not quite the best way. We'd rather have the parents uh, teach the child and have the child grow up, uh, but yet baptism is a, a means of grace. So, yes. So it's one of those hard things. We'd like to have a, a definite answer, especially in utero, but we don't. But we do know one thing, is that when you take water with God's word, something special happens. Now, at any moment, we can still reject that faith, okay? Even after we are baptized, we can still reject it, and that's why we need to continue to teach that. Um, but when we uh, were talking about, say, the getting back to your initial question, which is one that Christians also uh, debated about for many times, um, is it better for the child to die in utero than to be born and risk the chance of uh, them rejecting the faith? And again, I'm, we're not gonna answer that one, but we're just gonna leave it into God's grace and mercy, okay? Um, I would always like to have the opportunity for the child to be born, uh, to uh, proclaim God's word, and to use the gifts that God gave that child uh, to be used in society, and say, children are a gift from God, so let's embrace that gift. That would be my take on that. Okay, did I kind of answer your questions, or you still got more? Or? No, I just don't agree, that's all. Oh, okay. That's okay. Okay, so um, uh, then, okay, let's go on with uh, verse uh, 16. Uh, so again, this is a continuation of that sentence. Uh, Paul's writing, uh, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And then he immediately brings up I did not immediately consult with anyone. So notice where he's going with this, that this is God's gospel. This is not something that he, quote unquote, went to seminary for, okay? God revealed it to him. Uh, and then I have uh, the, uh, like a, a parallel passage here from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. God who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Yes, God does want everyone to believe and trust in him, okay? Um, one of the interesting questions about this uh, that uh, St. Paul brings up in verse 16 here is St. Paul didn't consult with anyone, okay? And so we often talk about the difference between an inner call where God says, I want you to proclaim God's word and an outer call. Now, this is going to sound a little strange here, but um, nowadays we actually do consult with others before pastors are allowed to publicly preach in our denomination. For example, I am actually approved by the faculty of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, my alma mater, to be able to proclaim God's word in a public way. Now, that's not to take away what St. Paul is saying here, okay? God can, does indeed uh, give us this faith and expects all of us to be sharing this faith and to proclaim what Christ has done for us. Uh, but in today's world, especially with a lot of things that happen with people who are uh, pastors, uh, we want to make sure our, our pastors are well-trained and approved by 
the seminary uh, and are formed a little bit by the seminary faculty. So the seminary sort of gives its stamp of approval that this person is eligible to receive a public call to serve a congregation. Uh, back during the time of St. Paul, we didn't have seminaries. And because we didn't have seminaries, okay, doing this teaching, uh, St. Paul was doing his teaching and then somebody else came by and was teaching something else. So how do you determine what's true? And the answer is you always go back to God's word. Uh, but Paul here is actually saying um, he was called directly by God. And we're like, doesn't God do that anymore? And the answer is yes, I would say that I was called by God and that since I'm connected to Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, that call would then send me off to seminary, be approved by the faculty so that I could proclaim God's word here. Okay, so it's a, it's a little bit of a different time, but yet God is still calling. And ultimately my call to publicly teach and preach comes from you, from the congregation that says, we want Pastor Bala to be the man here at Peace Lutheran Church to be doing this public teaching and proclaiming of God's word. Any question about that and the call? Okay, let's go on to uh, verse 17. Paul's continuing this line of thought. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went uh, away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus, okay? Again, no seminary training for Paul per se, Christian seminary training. Now we're gonna get back to a question I told John to put on hold for a little bit. Was St. Paul educated in the scriptures? The answer is yes. So I bring in from Acts chapter 22, verse three, Paul is speaking here. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. The feet of Gamaliel, hold on a second, that is like uh, in a, an Ivy League education by, in today's world, okay? This was one of the, the uh, main teachers of it. Gamaliel was, uh, um, uh, a great Jewish teacher in very, very high standing, okay? And people really, really listened to him. So what's your take home point on this? Is that Paul was well educated, you could say, in what we would call the Old Testament. He probably knew the Old Testament inside and out, but he didn't make the connection until God revealed himself on the road to Damascus. Do you know of another New Testament account where something similar of like this occurred? A little bit of a testing the brain here. Where people were kind of educated and then God revealed himself and then they got it. Post-resurrection, Road to Emmaus, the disciples. Remember, they were rejected after seeing Jesus die on the cross. They were heading back to Emmaus. All of a sudden, Jesus appears and starts walking with them and starts explaining the scriptures to them. They still didn't quite get it. I mean, they even said, we're not our hearts burning here until then Jesus revealed himself to them in the breaking of the bread, and then they got it. Then they go running back to Jerusalem, late at night, so to speak, to tell the rest of the disciples that Jesus appeared to them. So again, these were disciples that were taught with Jesus, okay? They heard what Jesus said. Uh, they walked with Jesus. They saw him die. They missed the connections of the Old Testament. Jesus now reveals himself to them, and now they get it. Same concept happened with Paul here. He understood he had a very great education at the Old Testament, but he didn't quite understand the gospel 
until, until Jesus reveals that gospel to him. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, John? If he was educated in really uh, contributed to that period of time. Did it go all the way up to Isaiah? Oh, the Old Testament would go all the way through to Malachi was the last prophet. Yeah, I know it does today, but how about this time? Even, even in the time of... Um, but then if uh, he had all this knowledge, he must have had a lot of doubt in his mind. Ah, you see, you can have the knowledge. There's a difference between knowledge of the scriptures and faith. That's the key. And St. Paul had that knowledge, but he couldn't connect the dots because the Holy Spirit hadn't yet come upon him. And once the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he believes, then the dots get connected. You see, an atheist can read the Bible from Genesis through to Revelation and still be an atheist and not believe. Okay, a Christian doesn't even have to read the Bible from Genesis through Revelation, but the Holy Spirit can work through that word of God, even if it's not the entire word of God, and create saving faith. So there's a difference between knowledge and faith. But what happens when you have knowledge with faith, especially a, not, a lot of knowledge, well, you get St. Paul, who does a very great job in articulating that faith. Okay, but let's continue on with St. Paul here. Uh, verse 18. Then, after three years, he then says, Yeah, I did go to Jerusalem to visit uh, Cephas, and that's uh, Peter, okay, and remained with him 15 days. Okay. How many years did I spend in seminary? Um, a good four years. Okay. And after I graduated from seminary, did I know it all? I may have thought I knew it all, but the reality is no, I didn't. Okay. Uh, and I'm still learning today. What St. Paul is trying to make the point is for three years, he was proclaiming God's word. Okay. Oh, yeah, he did go visit Peter. He did go to Jerusalem, so to speak. He did go to the place, to the, uh, uh, you know, to the mother church, so to speak. Uh, but I only, he only spent a couple weeks there. That's it. He's trying to make a point here that what God revealed to him was from God, not from Peter. Okay? He goes on to say, uh, I saw none of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. But then I bring in a little quote here from Luther here. But why does Paul repeat so often, almost too often, that he did not learn his gospel from men or even from the apostles themselves? It is his purpose to persuade the churches of Galatia that, uh, which had been led astray by false apostles and to convince them beyond any doubt that his gospel was the true word of God. Okay, so he was, again, trying to make this point. He didn't just receive it from somebody, but he received it from God. So this is the true gospel, okay? Because, again, there was some doubt in their minds about what do we believe? And instead of going back to scripture to find out, they started trusting uh, what other people were saying to them. John? Is that still happening today? Oh, yes, it's still happening today. I'm actually, let me jump ahead because I actually have a slide. I don't want to grab the Bible passage to it uh, because that I'm, I'm skipping like about half dozen Bible passages, but um, just something that's interesting to that. So again, the point I'm trying to make was the gospel was given to him by God, okay? Uh, he did not learn it from other people. He didn't learn it from his mom or dad. God revealed it to him. And something that just happened a couple weeks ago. Ignore the Bible passage, okay? Notice the little logo. Uh, did you realize that Franklin Graham was in town? <laughs> 
the Route 66 God Loves You Tour. Franklin Graham is the son of uh, Billy Graham. You've heard of Billy Graham. Okay. Um, and it's interesting what happens when the son picks up the ministry, so to speak, of uh, the father. Billy Graham was a, a great man. Okay. Uh, and nothing wrong with that. We actually sometimes have pastors who are sons of other pastors and so forth down the line. Uh, but I just wanted to toss this logo at you for a reason, is to say, yep, we just had that here. Um, and uh, Billy Graham is, I'm sorry, Franklin Graham is definitely following in the footsteps of his father, uh, Billy Graham. Um, we have a little bit of a different understanding of the forgiveness of sins and how we receive it. I'm going to get to that in the prayer uh, when we get to that part of it. But I just wanted just to let you know that even in today's society, sometimes this idea of one generation teaching the next generation is not a bad idea. But for St. Paul, it was not that he learned the gospel from somebody else, not even from the apostles, not even from his parents. He doesn't even bring up Gamaliel. He says, I received it from God. Okay, so that's kind of uh, important there. So um, after that, after he says um, he saw none really except for James, the, the Lord's brother, and now he's going to get to an oath. Verse 20, and I'll end at this oath. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. He's now going to sit there and say, this is the truth. Now, is it appropriate for Christians to take oaths like this? So I bring in a, a, a snippet from Luther's small catechism. This is in the explanation of our current edition of the catechism, uh, where it says, an oath sometimes honors and glorifies God or serves our neighbor. Examples include swearing to tell the truth in court or marriage vows, where we assure our neighbor that we are accountable to God to tell the truth and keep our promises. So speaking an oath is not bad. St. Paul does it. Uh, sometimes Christians do run into some concerns like we shouldn't speak any oaths at all, but St. Paul does do that. And our catechism, of course, then reminds us, you know, some oaths are not bad, okay? Uh, that we are accountable to God. Uh, you know, like in court or our marriage vows, uh, and saying, yep, I'm going to remain faithful to this person. Uh, and yep, or what I'm going to tell you is the absolute truth. And so St. Paul wants to reaffirm what he is saying is indeed the truth. Let me just pick up one other slide because there's not too much to that. Uh, then I went to the regions of uh, Syria and Cilicia. Okay, so what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, Folks, you know how I was raised. You know what happened. You know the history here. Why are you doubting that the gospel that we brought to you is anything but the true gospel? So that is the argument um, he's trying to make. And at this point, uh, why don't we close here? Uh, and just as a reminder, um, Let's see, well, hold on a second. I lost my train of thought here. Next week, uh, yes, next week, Thursday, I am here. So I'm at Pastor's Conference. You'll probably see that in the bulletin. Uh, Monday through Wednesday, I will have my um, Bible study ready for Thursday. So don't worry about that. So if you're thinking in the back of your mind, will Pastor be there on Thursday? The answer is yes, I will be here uh, Thursday. I do have a Thursday coming up in October that I won't be here. But, well, when we get closer to that, I will remind you of that, okay? But let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.